This will be our two o'clock panel covering understanding business law, cannabis business law, regulation, and oversight. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Khalil Ferguson, president of United Coral Alliance. We're a local nonprofit here in Sacramento. I'm a company with some friends and mentors and professors of mine. Um, I will let them introduce themselves and give a brief intro about their background, and we can dive into some questions. How does that sound? Sounds good. So am I supposed to introduce myself first since I'm next to you? Yes, sir. First of all, uh, I have the joy of teaching Khalil criminal law. That's not a how-to course, by the way. Uh, wonderful student, great fun to teach him. My name is Mike Fatello. I've been teaching law for many, many years, and I have been teaching marijuana law since, uh, ninth, uh, since 2017. Uh, and my first exposure to marijuana was in the 1960s when I was on a college campus. And in my remarks, I'll talk about, well, you don't know what I, my contact was. <laughs> but anyway, well, I'll be talking about the development, uh, what I've seen personally uh, since then as changes in marijuana policy. Well, hello, uh, my name is Davina Smith and I'm the Cannabis Program Manager for the City of Sacramento. I also am an attorney um, uh, for about 15 years before I took this job. I worked as a deputy county counsel in both Solano counties and Humboldt counties. And prior to that, I was a deputy district attorney in uh, Humboldt County prosecuting cannabis and other uh, things. So it's been kind of an interesting change of in, in circumstances in life for me. And, and it's, uh, it's one I'm, I'm really happy happened and happy to uh, talk about cannabis regulations and permitting with you all. Davina, does that make you the cannabis queen in Sacramento? It does not. Ah, there you go. No beheading for me, thank you. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Kathy Finnerty. I'm um, a business lawyer who has been involved in cannabis since about 2015. Uh, <clears throat> been a practicing attorney here in Sacramento and across the United States for about 30 years. And I'm not very good at math. Um, but what I love about the cannabis industry is, is the culture. Um, I love the commitment to sustainability. I love the avenues and doors that it opens for people who have been affected and impacted by the war on drugs. And as tough as things are in this industry, I just want to help maintain some hope and see how we can all get through this. So. Thank you for that. I guess we'll dive into our questions. The first question will be Professor, for Professor Patello. In your experience, how has cannabis policy changed over the turn of the century? How has it shifted from the, since the war on drugs? Yeah, so let me go back in time. I was born in 1946. I have two older brothers. And had they seen, you all have seen Reefer Madness? If not, go online on YouTube. You can find Reefer Madness, but you got to watch it. Because had they seen it when they were young, they would have taken it seriously. It was about the demon weed. I saw it in 1969 or 1970 in a movie theater in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where you could get a contact high with people smoking marijuana. That's a measure of the change from 100 years ago or so when marijuana laws were racially identified laws that were in place to criminalize people of color. It started to change in my generation, the anti-war generation, People were smoking marijuana, partly out of protest that the government said it was no good. We knew that it was okay. So on college campuses in the 1960s, it proliferated. I guarantee you though, in those days, I would never have expected to see something like this. The marijuana that was being smoked in those days, no one here would go anywhere near it. So that's in the 1960s when we're starting to see the change. In 1970, when the government adopted the Controlled Substances Act, marijuana, out of political compromise, was made a Schedule I drug, one for which there's no medical use. Nixon made that compromise, the president at the time, knowing full well, I think, that he would never agree to removing it as a Schedule I drug. And the federal government, ever since then, has fought hard to keep it as a Schedule I drug. During the Ray, uh, Nixon administration, though, penalties for marijuana were reduced somewhat. Where it really got serious was in the Reagan war on drugs. 
I wanted to ask the folks who were talking up here who, uh, in the previous lecture, whether they understood the full implications if the federal government tried to criminalize their farming operations, what the penalties might be. Literally, life in prison, forfeiture of their property. How we got here is a really bizarre story. Dur happily, during the Obama administration, the federal government took the position that if state legal industries complied with certain federal priorities, they would be allowed to, to be left alone. And that's how we got to the place we are. Money has been invested in the industry. I mean, again, this would have been possible without the forbearance of the federal government. But we still live in this bizarre universe where I guess it keeps lawyers busy. Uh, it keeps me interested in the intellectual challenges. But if you're in the industry, it must be frightening because if the federal government decided in the next administration, as it, we thought it might be doing during the Trump administration, then presumably forbearance would go away and they could start prosecuting again. Yeah, as you did. I know well, we can I, talk I, much I, more about that. But I was happy that I, he gave me a, a, good, a, a good grade for my answer. He just finished taking my exam and luckily did well too. Be good to him. <laughs> Be good to him. <laughs> you see who I have uh, support from. I'm just kidding. Thank you for that, Professor. Um, for Kathy, how have changes to cannabis business regulation impacted how you represent clients over the years? Um, I come from a banking background and have done a, a fair amount of environmental <clears throat> cleanup and regulation. So I'm very uh, accustomed to maneuvering in over-regulated industries. But I think the biggest thing and we've all touched on this a little bit in our previous conversations, is we took a legacy industry. You know, some people who were multi-generational uh, pot growers, and then we put them in this intensely regulated environment. And the culture shock was uh, almost disabling. The culture shock was numbing. The taxes have been disabling. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so trying to explain to somebody who's never complied with a regulation how they now have to comply with a mountain of regulations, some that don't even relate to cannabis per se. For example, Proposition 65. A number of the cannabis companies got sued for Prop 65 violations in their first year. You know, and that's a pretty esoteric uh, type of regulation. So basically, it's, it's persuading clients that the regulations are there and you have to comply with them. There's, they're not optional. And yes, they're burdensome. Yes, they're expensive. Yes, they may prevent you from succeeding in your business, but it is the only way to operate as a licensed operator. Poor choice of words, but close enough. Could you expand on Prop C5 and what that regulated and why cannabis business operators were getting sued under Prop C5? Happily, in California, Proposition 65 was enacted probably 30 years ago, and it is the regulation that says if something is likely to cause reproductive cancer or cancer generally, that you have to put a notice on the product. So here we had all these eights floating around, and they all had to be labeled all of a sudden overnight. And you know that was in the early days of retail where things were hopping so so in that same light would you say that it's hard for cannabis business operators to not only meet the cannabis regulations but then to even operate a business in conformity with California and federal laws absolutely you know and California is highly regulated no doubt um, I'm sure our legislature means well but probably has never operated a business themselves and then you add to that the layer of effect federal complexity. For example, the fact that we've not been able to pass the Safe Banking Act does absolutely nothing to help anyone. All it does is create opportunities for people to attack those who are carrying hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash, but because of the regulations. Thank you. We can, we can go on and on. Oh, we can go on and on. I'm trying really hard to stop because I want to hear what Davina has to say. <laughs> yes. 
So for Davina, what have been the joys and the hardships of uh, regulating a local cannabis economy and industry? Yeah, so, um, you know, as, as it's been mentioned by my colleagues up here, regulations um, are difficult for cannabis businesses. Um, regulations change over time. Um, I think what we have seen in the city of Sacramento specifically is that um, cannabis was regulated from a place of fear initially. Um, people didn't know really what was going to happen. Um, I think there were certainly plenty of people in the city of Sacramento that thought that the sky was going to fall once uh, a cannabis business opened. Um, what we have seen over the last five plus years um, is that the sky hasn't fallen. Um, we just this last year commissioned um, a, an economic study of cannabis um, in, our, in our city and our region and that showed that um, cannabis was a huge economic driver in our city and in our region and that we are a regional powerhouse for cannabis. We're bringing a lot of revenue to the city, we're bringing a lot of revenue to our local businesses, we are bringing jobs that come in. Um, cannabis, I think, is an economic force moving forward. Um, I think one of the things that brings me joy in my position um, as the, the cannabis program manager is looking at those regulations and seeing what works, what isn't working, both for the city and for the businesses. Um, I know change is incremental. I think that we've had this perspective, certainly from my colleague, that, you know, 50 years ago, we would not be here. We'd all be in jail, right? I mean, <laughs> just for being at this activity, probably. Yeah, yes, yes, aiding an eight or the better. That's that's us up here. Um, so I think I think that is an important perspective to have. Um, my hope is that we don't get to the normalization of cannabis and cannabis businesses in Sacramento and in our area um, over 50 years. My hope is that it happens faster than that. I think it is snowballing. I think as people see um, change, that 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 we're going to make more change. And so that's the thing that I think is really great. The hardships are just, you know, it is a, a very regulated environment. I, I semi-jokingly say the only more regulated business you could get into is sort of, you know, nuclear material, right? You've got so much interest from the state, the locals. California is a state of nimbyism, right? That's why it's so hard to do affordable housing and things like that in our communities. Um, and it's the same thing with cannabis. So I think that it, it that's that's probably the hard thing is you know we've got we've got regulations on the book. My job is to to make sure businesses comply with them. I don't necessarily agree with them on a personal level. I understand that this is something we have, and I look to change them where it makes sense. Um, and so that's kind of the the hardship is talking to businesses about these things that they don't want to do. That's hard for them. That may actually send them under, and I can't do anything about that. You know, I can barely get my clients to read the regulations. They want me to read it and give them the cliff notes. Well, that's great, but you're not going to pass the exam. Read the darn regulations yourself. It's very difficult. Yeah. Kathleen, I want to ask you a question. I think it'll help the audience to understand something. So marijuana, all these businesses are violating federal law. Lawyers have an obligation, an ethical duty, not to help their clients commit crimes. So here we've got Kathleen. Now, the Bar Association has worked out a rough compromise. So what I want to know, I'd love for you to describe the conversation you're supposed to have with your clients to the audience, and I want to hear how it goes. In other words, I can't help you, or I can't encourage and counsel you about how to break the law. Well, <clears throat> if it's illegal federally, how do I go about doing that? First, we talk about interstate commerce versus intrastate commerce, meaning keep it in the state. That's your first, you know, that's your first bound of defense. Secondly, it is illegal as a matter of federal law, and I cannot counsel you on how to break federal law. Third, I think that's a really stupid law, but I still can't do it because I have ethics. <laughs> um, but it was a very nervous time until the American Bar Association came out with an opinion that lawyers could rely on, that we wouldn't lose our license for trying to help. Um, and really at that point, Professor, I, I felt more like a civil rights lawyer than anything else. Um, I, I was helping people come out of the cannabis closet, right? And helping people literally be liberated from the constraints of having to operate in the black market. Yes, they were making a lot of money, but they didn't sleep very well. And raids were common and often not known about in 
for an industry with this quality of humanity, you know, the, the cultivators, the distributors, the delivery companies that I know are largely, you know, married couples with 2.5 children in a white picket fence. Um, or in some of the, the neighborhoods of color, they're still some of the best citizens of that neighborhood. And it's been that way for as long as I can remember. So it, it breaks my heart, but it's still a civil rights battle. And that means we've got 50 more years of work until we, until we get to where I think we want to be. Right. Professor, could you expand on the memos that were issued under the Obama administration and their impact on our ability to have a recreational market? Yes. Yes. So uh, think back to Prop 215. You all are too young to remember 1996, I suspect. Uh, but what happened was during... Where were you born, dear? That's what I thought. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know. I know. There are a lot of us here who remember that. Yeah. But um, during the, the 19, well, during the 1980s, during the AIDS crisis, and as more cancer patients understood the medical uses of marijuana, there was a lot of pressure to uh, do compassionate use, some kind of legislation that would give access to marijuana for seriously ill patients. Pete Wilson was the governor, he vetoed it. So we ended up using the, well, not me, I was not part of it, but using the initiative process to get Prop 215, which legalized, or at least made, if you were complying with state law, you were not violating state marijuana laws, still violating federal law. One of the things that did was it started bringing money into the industry. People were feeling a little bit more secure about investing in the industry. Now, what happened was, the George W. Bush administration, Department of Justice, when he was the president, aggressively raided cannabis businesses. In 2008, Barack Obama, then the candidate, campaigned in part on taking a kinder approach towards state legal medical marijuana facilities. Early in his administration, a member of the Department of Justice named Ogden issued a memorandum, henceforth the Ogden Memorandum, that said basically we're going to give you space to function as long as you comply with federal regula these federal law enforcement priorities, you can survive. We'll stop raiding you. And that really was instrumental. That gave people interested in recreational marijuana the incentive to put ballot initiatives on the ballot in Colorado and Washington for recreational marijuana. Those passed, uh, and then California got Prop 64 in 2016, uh, timed for a national presidential election, because that's when you young people come out to vote, uh, and so you're more likely to vote for legalizing marijuana than a lot of people of my generation. So that was the critical moment, the Ogden and then Cole Memoranda after the Colorado and Washington initiatives legalized recreational marijuana. And the importance was that meant that capital, people were willing to invest. And I, I think I can say this, um, money talks, bullshit walks. And when there's money, follow the money. And as long as there's money being invested in the industry, it makes it more and more plausible that a national solution will come about, even though we're banging our heads against the wall at getting safe banking and also uh, tax reform and the like. So anyway, that was instrumental. We saw a huge inf increase in investment dollars uh, after the coal memo, because there was still, the Ogden memo had been out, but what was the new administration gonna do? And then boom, it really took off from there. So hopefully there's something favorable in the future at the federal level. For Davina, thank you for that, Professor. Thank you, Kathy. For Davina, how do you see, this isn't on the questions list. It's not bad. Um, how do you see the future of the cannabis industry helping to fuel Sacramento's tourism industry? Yeah, I think that's actually a really exciting um, sort of cross-pollinization. Um, 
we know from some of our, our sister jurisdictions, right? Um, I think West Hollywood is a great example, right? Cannabis tourism is, is a thing. People go, they want to check that out. Um, I was just down in Southern California recently and there's a, a hotel in, in um, Desert Hot Springs that advertises as a cannabis friendly hotel. I think they were the first one to do that. And, and they say they get tons of business. People who are wanting to come, be able to smoke cannabis, relax in a hotel room, not drive anywhere, right? And just, just chillax, right? By the pool. Um, and how, how lovely does that sound? And right? spend money. And spend money, right? Exactly. And so I think, especially as we look at, at Sacramento, we've always been a government town, right? And in, in with COVID, all of our downtown hotels are empty, right? That It hasn't rebounded. There's not the same traffic of government people coming in. Um, it's just not there. So I think I could see a, definitely a place where we have our downtown and our midtown areas set up sort of a, as an entertainment zone for cannabis, where you have a, a cannabis trail that we, we, you know, maps that we send out to, to with our, our tourism bureau, right? Where people can kind of go, cannabis dispensaries, restaurants, cool museums to relax in parks to, to look at the rose garden, right? I mean, wouldn't that be lovely when you're high to just kind of walk around there and just enjoy the flowers? I mean, let's be honest, right? Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can look at. How can we sort of, again, integrate cannabis into um, our economic lives in Sacramento and really kind of create a benefit for businesses, for regulators, for tourists who come here? I mean, I, was, I have a teenage son and he, he asked me, you know, he's of course a board, you know, he, he thinks it's so boring here. Why does anybody come to Sacramento? You know, and it's sort of like, why does a tourist come to Sacramento? I mean, I have to think a minute. I mean, we have we have cool things, right? We totally do. But, you know, my teenage son is like, everything's boring here. It's flat. It's boring. It's not exciting. But gosh, if he's 22 and we have a cannabis entertainment zone, I bet he'd be happy to host friends. <laughs> and his friends would be like wanting to come and check these things out. I think it's an opportunity that we'd be foolish to not look closely at. I'm so glad to hear that because I think that's got to happen. We've got to get cannabis consumption lounges where people can go and enjoy and spend money, right? Make more jobs so that the people in the industry, uh, you know, have greater opportunities. And of course, that will increase the demand, which will help the cultivators deal with the oversaturation of the market. Um, I think, you know, we're, <clears throat> think about this, Sacramento's farm to fork right why shouldn't we be farmed to fork with cannabis as well what a, can you imagine the the tower bridge dinner that'd be fun that would be awesome <laughs> you know, we, we've talked about that in my office about how that would be so cool It'd right so cool. a 420 celebration yeah to fork dinner right infused courses you know that'd be awesome <laughs> the fireworks over the river cats game you know i, I can see it all happen i believe can tourism is, is a huge opportunity for this town. Um, but mostly I just want, my personal objective is I want to see less regulation, allowing people greater flexibility to use their creativity to generate legitimate tax dollars so that the industry can thrive, so that there's an industry 10 years from now and we're not stuck in some of the places we used to be years ago. So I think that's going to be my next career tour guide. <laughs> if it's very timely, yeah. I'll give you one second. I'll just a minute. I think it's very timely. Um, a something member Matt Haney at SF has a bill AB three five seven that yep. will allow for um, cannabis consumption lounges that are currently in operation in San Francisco when we're out ever uh, elsewhere and throughout the state to also sell things like coffee and uh, other pastry items such as the Amsterdam style model and. Just that bill alone gives that vision of, you see where California overall may want to go with regards to having these conceptual lounges, especially as Sacramento develops the rail yards and has a major league soccer stadium and wants to become that global city that attracts tourism. So I think it's very likely and it's hopefully it will come soon with the right advocacy through our city council members and board supervisor members to do that. Let so me, Let me interrupt for one yes, quick second. That bill just passed the assembly, we know that. Yeah. How, <clears throat> I don't know how the Senate is currently constructed. Does anybody? Or you have an opinion it's, on the Senate is much more progressive than the our current uh, assembly. So most of our drug related bills that either progress or allow for expanded access usually comes out of the Senate. So for that bill to have already made it out of the assembly is likely for that bill to make it out of the Senate much easier. Are you trying to tell me that's dope? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to go ahead and ask a question? 
Thank you very much, and thank you very much for this both historical and current overview. Um, just to inject, uh, inject a tiny bit of reality, um, our farm is very tiny. We're between Laytonville and Garberville. Every fourth property from Willits up to Garberville is for sale. Over half of the businesses are shuttered. Our re one remaining market in Laytonville is closing. In Mendocino County, taxes last year were less than half of what was expected. The primary reason for that is during 215, before 64, there was cash infusion, keeping businesses open and providing jobs. Now, approximately 80% of the over 8,000 identified small farms in Mendocino County are gone. A few of us are hanging on. Without, and forgive me for mentioning this point again, but without an actual small license, a real micro-business, micro-business as it stands now is not micro. It requires at least a million dollars to get started. We need a small business license. We have been, had home businesses, small operations in areas that are geographically unsuitable to build an F1 occupancy building, Bureau of Cannabis Control. We strongly recommend a real cottage micro business to save what is left of artisanal cannabis in California. Speaking about cannatourism, consumption lounges, the, res the present situation in the San Francisco Bay Area is there is a moratorium on all new cannabis dispensaries over half are bankrupt. Two of the remaining consumption lounges are closing. No one can bear a 70% plus taxation for the big, the big girls and the big boys. For us who are very small, we are almost completely wiped out. So, you know, forgive me, but talking about fireworks and can of tourism in Sacramento, you will absolutely have that from big corporate cannabis, primarily from Southern California. It wouldn't take a lot to include us. It would take a new bill allowing small home businesses. Thank you. I, I wanna to respond to her comment because I, I thoroughly believe in what you're saying for preserving not only the industry, but, but, but the real humanity, the, the real culture. That's the word I'm looking for. And there's a model for what you're saying. It's what Temecula did to support the wineries that were failing there. Again, three-tiered system, problem, direct to consumer. Why couldn't we go cannabis tasting in the smaller areas where you could sell related products, you would have people coming to your farms and um, I think that would be huge to sit. It would be a huge benefit, especially to the small growers. I want to follow up on something. I'm sure that, well, I hope I can, other folks will understand why what happened to you happened. Many of us who voted for Prop 64 felt like it was a little bit of a Trojan horse. Part of the problem with Prop 64, when you go to the table, and you have everybody interested, you're trying to prevent, say, her organization, League of Cities, from voting against it or opposing it, law enforcement from opposing it. You put a little bit of something on the table for everybody. But one of the things that many of us thought were, was happening in Prop 64 was that small was protected. And then we learned later that stacking of licenses was going to be permitted. And th those of us who had fear of the Coca-Cola of uh, why, uh, uh, marijuana? Walmart Plus. Walmart Plus, yeah. That we suddenly realized that there was a, a back door that circumvented at least what many of us thought we were voting for. And that, that is an ongoing problem. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll chime in to get all three of us. <laughs> um, 
So I, I, I definitely agree. I think, I think what, when my colleague says that, that Prop 64 was a Trojan horse, I think that's totally true. I think it was a lot of that, again, fear-based initiative writing, right? They're trying to sell it in horse trade to get enough people to vote for it to, to get it to pass, right? And sort of the, the, the sausage making of, of, of government. Um, but it is true. I mean, it, the taxes are too high. There's way too much money going into like BSCC grants. That's the Bureau of State. What is it? Prisons and community. Yeah. Um, you know. I mean, it's 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 the agent state agency that oversees prisons and and probation and parole and all that kind of stuff. Um, why are cannabis tax funded grants coming out of there? Isn't that a strange connection? Um, and yet there's so much less money for um, local equity cannabis businesses, right, through, through cannabis tax on the state level. I, I really think there needs to be a second initiative that's, that's brought forth to bring forward some of the things you're talking about. There's very limited ability, and, and you, you guys can talk about this more than I can, to change Prop 64 in, in the legislative arena, but another initiative that looks at, okay, we're, we're, we're you know, <laughs> five years into this, what's happening to our industry? And while we can't rely on other markets and selling our cannabis legally to you know, Nevada or Oregon or look to the, our partners in the Pacific Rim, I mean, the Pacific Rim is opening up. I mean, the fact that the Philippines is talking about legalizing medical cannabis, that's huge. Um, we, we, we're, we're constrained to California. So I think looking at another initiative process, now that we've sort of learned some lessons and figured out what's not working, how can we fix this, and how can we fix Prop 64, which had some good, but also a lot of bad, some unintended, some intended. And to build on that, one of the hardest parts in the legislature to amend Prop 64 is that it was a constitutional amendment. So any legislation that we even drive up to amend, a constitutional amendment requires a higher threshold of lobbying work and votes by the uh, by the legislators. So as opposed to being a 50 plus one vote, we need a 60% or two thirds vote of both houses to pass that amendment to make, to overcome the wrongdoings or the, the obstacles that Prop 64 presented. And that's been the hardest barrier in the legislators trying to overcome that threshold because it was a constitutional amendment that the people voted on. So that's, that's also which hinders our ability to, to do so. And I'll get to you and want to, to build on um, Kathy's um, proposal or Kathy's idea of how they supported the wineries in Temecula. There's a current bill in the Senate right now called AB 1111, authored by Assemblymember Pellerine. And the bill essentially allows um, cultivators to sell directly to consumers for 32 days out of the year via using an event license. Um, so if you have a Hall of Flowers or, or, or Coachella or an event like that, and you have that event license, it expands the current event license, the event license type for, or the event license, um, structure in California and allows those small farmers, well, actually Origins Council is one of our friends who sponsored that bill. Yes, so we're trying to help you know, make, reduce those costs and reduce those barriers for that, but at least my analysis says that the, the benefit would be marginal, but at least providing some type of reprieve and relief because the only way for the, the cultivators to sell to, the, you know, to get to the customer is by going through a distro and relying on the distro to get to a, uh, a retail. So at least having the ability to sell directly as we have our wine tasting uh, opportunities throughout California to do so. And I want to recognize you right here with the, uh, to answer, ask a question. So in Prop 64, we had this thing called the cultivation tax. The DCC turned around and regulation. We can't do that. Can you speak into the mic, sir? Oh, sorry. Here we go. So in Prop 64, there was a cultivation tax. Obviously, when the bottom fell out of the state of California, the DCC turned around and put an emergency regulation to abolish the cultivation tax. Yeah. Can't you do that on some level with these things? Or is it a completely different regulatory process? That, when that, how, that bill took about four years. Senator Laird was trying to pass that bill since 2019 to get rid of the cultivation tax and it took that four year advocacy for that to even come to fruition. Um, the year they got the cultivation tax removed, Senator Laird got language into the budget um, with, through negotiations with uh, Governor Newsom. And that's how that language was included to provide some type of um, remedy because the, the stakeholders who are, are uh, advocating against the elimination of the cultivation tax were direct stakeholders that were included in Prop 64. Um, so it takes a lot of political capital and a lot of organizing work from the small farmers who are principally working with Senator Laird, who represents them. It took about three or four years to get that even included in the budget and finally adopted through negotiations with all the stakeholders and Governor Newsom. But they got rid of the cultivation tax because nobody was going to pay it because the price of cannabis was three grand to five thousand. Yes. They had to put an emergency regulation. They couldn't kill our industry. 
Well, and I think you're right. I think it's going to come from DCC. You know, there are going to have to be some adjustments, some alterations, whether there are some forgiveness programs or there are grants or some other means. Like the, the lady intelligently said, there needs to be an infusion of capital into small growers. Right. Because the cost for a small grower to produce a pound of herb is about $500. The cost for one of the mega growers is about $125 per pound. So that's a very large disparity. Um, one of the models that I'm seeing working very well in Humboldt is a collective model where I represent 13 different growers who you know, try and collectively buy product, supplement soil supplies so they get the benefit of that, and then collectively operated dispensaries so that they have a lower cost in having a, a market for their goods. But I don't think that small growers can do it on their own at this point. But again, collectives, condominiums, and cash. That's what they need. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think, I think especially for small cultivators in particular, it's tough because there's also all the CEQA requirements, right, right that, that are super expensive to, to go through, right? Just getting an EIR, the mitigation, everything else. And so many, I mean, you know, in Trinity, in Cumboldt, in Mendocino, that's one of the big issues is trying to get a small farm permitted. It's cost so much, even the large ones, you know, you're looking at $100,000 for an EIR easily. Um, what small business has that just capital lying around? And then, of course, that doesn't include the, the mitigation costs, which may be considerable. Um, it's, it's, it's tough, and I, I don't really have any answers on how that's going to be. I, I feel it's, it's, like, it's almost like a, there's so many tendrils going out, right? There's right. There's, there's CEQA. There's, um, you know, I mean, I, so many things that, that involve. It's just, it's hard to this find This is where the condominium or the collective model really can help. Because imagine if you have to commission a $50,000 CEQA EIR. Well, what if five growers in the immediately adjacent area, their CEQA investigation is going to be roughly similar. The mitigation measures may be different. But instead of each of them spending 50, five of them spend 10. And, and I think that's, we've seen it with um, you know, developing security plans. We've seen it with you know, developing, getting a CUP through, conditional use permit for the land itself. And we've seen it in, you know, the combined forces to lobby a particular neighborhood that's opposed to your project. Um, it is much more sustainable. Yeah, I, and I think it can be done. I mean, programmatic EIRs are done. Um, you know, done successfully. The, you know, I, I know in Humboldt County that we had a, a programmatic EIR over the run of a river for gravel mining, for example, right? That went through many different uh, areas. Um, the state, actually, BCC, back in the olden days, did a programmatic EIR of the entire state for cannabis, right? Cultivation in particular. And what did they find? More specific environmental determinations needed to be made. And that's when they put the requirement on all the local jurisdictions that every single local jurisdiction had to require some kind of environmental determination for cannabis businesses. For us in Sacramento, it's it's pretty straightforward because all of our all of our grows are in built environments. It's all indoor grows. So, you know, when you're bringing a cannabis business into an already built environment, there's not really any CEQA implications that there's any environmental concerns, right? But when you're putting it on the side of a hill, right, under a bunch of redwoods with a stream, you know, with salmonid, <laughs> you know, a salmonid bearing stream, all of a sudden, you know, you've got a lot of things that you have to look at. Um, and it's a different, different, different kind of area. Um, I think, I think programmatic EIRs, I think growers coming together to, to do sort of these bigger EIRs is, is a thing, but it's, it's still expensive. So I think, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I think CEQA is something that definitely needs to be looked at for the state when, and when it comes to cannabis. It would be great if the state took on, on as, a, as a statewide project. Will they ever do it? I mean, we've got all that cannabis money, supposedly. You'd think they could, but yeah. But DCC is in the building, so we'll talk with them I after. No, I hope they hear this. Let's talk, DCC. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about four minutes left, and our, I guess our wrap up question for all of us. Unless, um, unless the audience has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Nobody on the side of the room has a question. Okay. I tried to give you each. I will. 
So small farmers direct to consumer, Jared Huffman introduced a bill that allows small farmers for less than 5,000 uh, square feet of cultivation or whatever it was to go direct to consumer across state lines. Chance in hell that ever happening soon? I mean, we have a bunch of attorneys. So I think I can speak from the legislative advocacy side, from the, what the how the legislator is uh, responding to that. And we passed a bill um, through CCIA last year to allow for interstate commerce, where the states have an agreement. Um, so California and the states, the states have to be landlocked because you can't travel over through a state that does not have um, the same laws or allow for recreational use. Um, and then I'm sure the attorneys here, my professor, can speak better to how that how you avoid federal <laughs> interstate commerce laws, um, even in doing so when you're using a federal highway system um, to do that. Um, so there's just many problems to overcome. The state has been privy to it and has been favorable to it. Um, we just don't know how the legislature will always respond given the makeup of the year, uh, the makeup of the legislature per year. The assembly has, has been our hardest legislative um, body to overcome because they're much more conservative than the Senate. So most of our bills, like interstate commerce, usually are, are a Senate bill or an SB, which means that the original House is the Senate and it flies through with almost passing colors. We face the hardship going into the other House. So it can be done. It just requires a lot of investment into the legislative advocacy space for cannabis bills, uh, cannabis bills and cannabis laws in general. But, but I'm with you. I think that multi-state operations are one of the essential ways for the industry to deal with the ebbs and flows of the supply and demand. Oversaturation would have been resolved pretty quickly, but it's going to take a while, a long while. Uh, we, we, uh, our, the state, as you all know, produces so much marijuana, there's no way we're going to consume it in state. And we know that a lot of it is going out of state. Don't tell the feds because it, that's all illegal. And I would love to see the paper that you're going to uh, write for the marijuana seminar on whether an interstate agreement between Oregon, Washington, and California would protect us from federal regulation based on their ability to regulate interstate commerce. I'm waiting for the answer because I don't know, but I think it would be a great paper for you to write. I, well, I have, no on, I think uh, in a couple of weeks, I have it on my calendar to follow up with you to be your research assistant, so hopefully that will be my assignment for the fall. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Wait for the microphone, please, sir. Why can't you use your ATM to buy marijuana? ATM? How can you change it? ATM. 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 Yeah, your credit card. Oh, gotcha. Because all banking transactions are cleared at the federal bank. And there is no way to circumvent that. Therefore, it violates federal law. And we have tried to set up California state banks for many years to avoid that. It's been unsuccessful. You're right. And only certain banks will do that because of the federal clearinghouse issue. And again, it still goes through the federal bank ultimately, and they are doing so at significant risk. Some of the risk comes from the federal insurance as well. That comes, they don't want to lose. Um, so my summer research is spending trying to figure out how a public bank can get federal insurance. Um, and that's the hardest part, is trying to have a state-run bank or a state-owned bank comply with the FDIC to get the insurance. And it's still even hard to get it, so not wanting to lose it through um, violating federal law, something that banks take don't take lightly. Um, so that they, if you get caught even having tr cannabis related transactions, your account's getting closed because they're not willing to take that risk if that's that bank. Yeah. Gotcha. They've been highly threatened. <laughs> yes. So that is it. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank um, you, I appreciate you. Appreciate the audience. Thank you guys. It's been great. Thank you, panelists.